Welcome to the podcast, Troy. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jen. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to you sharing your story. So tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from and what are you doing now? Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm from South Africa. I grew up in a very small town in Natal um, called Escort. And uh, then I moved to an even smaller town called Vintuk in Namibia. Um, so it was a very small town boy and um, ended up living in Cape Town uh, from when I was about 17 years old. So that's sort of where I'm from, South Africa, cool country, a lot of fun, can get can get quite exciting here um, with regards to the, the party scene, which we'll talk about later, and um, why I'm here to discuss this pain of addiction and that, that I've been through. And, and now I'm currently coaching um, anomalies, uh, industry leaders, uh, to help them illuminate the illusion of their minds, the stories that they create, um, and then help them break through that to become a super creator. So yeah, that's that's where I currently am now. Really enjoying it. Lots of fun and quite a, a stark difference from where I started um, my career. Yeah, and you haven't actually been coaching for that long, but you're doing some amazing things. So when did you start your coaching career? So I started coaching uh, in sort of 20, 2019, uh, July 2019. Yeah, so it's, it's been a very quick quick, fast journey, um, and I've stepped into this role of super, cre super cre creator, and now having experiences myself and these, these, these knowings and truths that I have that I've found and, and discovered, I just want to share this with, with people who are willing and open to step into this different way of living. Yeah, because not everyone's ready, right? No, Jen, people, people are not ready. They're quite scared because we're very conditioned to believe certain things and the way that the world should be. The world should be linear, apparently. And I'm a, I don't believe that. I believe that, that, that we can create whatever we want once we illuminate illusions um, and, and own our truth and are truthful to ourselves through brutal honesty and like a noble responsibility. That's a big, big thing. Taking responsibility for everything in your life, the good and the bad. Once you, once, once you start to do that, you open yourself up. And the truth, when you start to speak truth, your life speeds up because you don't have to, you, there's no point hiding it, things. And, and you, you can get to where you want to go faster because everyone understands where you are at and what you're thinking about. So truth is literally something that I think people it's, it's so difficult for people to, to step in, into truth with small things. I mean, think about white lies people tell. So like, I try and ensure that everything I do is truth because I used to lie a lot. I mean, being an addict or an addict in inverted commas, I used to lie a lot. And um, now I've just... You're a poker player as well. So you're, and you're poker. Sorry? You're poker fan. Yes. I mean, yeah. And poker. I mean, I played poker for six years for a living after my accounting and finance career um, I wouldn't say I was pro I was just making money doing it I wasn't like a top top pro but I played in Europe and yeah I had to, had to definitely lie and influence and manipulate people when I was when I was when I was playing poker which was a very interesting part of my life <laughs> so would you say because you've been in that position of telling the lies and being able to manipulate people you can see it from a distance in others 100% Playing poker taught me a lot, a lot about, about, well, obviously, obviously reading people and just really understanding little tells. I mean, and human beings have those too, the way we look, eyes up, eyes down, and little twitches in our arms, whatever. So when I'm with clients or with people in my life, you can see it and you call it out. And when you call it out, people are like, holy shit, he sees me. Oh my God, he actually sees me. And they get, and they can start a conversation with, with you, with you, with you. So, it, it definitely, it, it definitely was was um, a uh, an accelerator to, to that. But 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 yeah, I've always from from a very young age, I haven't really enjoyed people talking or, or, or um, having 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 a front. It was always like my bullshit radar was always up. <laughs> yes, the BS radar. Yeah. I just want to ask you a little bit more about the people you work with. You talked about anomalies and then talked about illuminating 
the mind and taking these quantum leaps. So can you talk about each of those words? Because for some people, they're big words that they don't understand. So what is an anomaly? Okay, cool. So an anomaly from what I, in my opinion, is a human being who, who has accomplished something that not many other people have accomplished. Okay. And they're doing things a bit differently. And they're not following the norm. They, they're not following the normal tra tra trajectory of what society has told us. And they've got to a point where they've achieved all this and they're bored because they are anomalies and they need something else, something extra, but they're bored. So I help them get from that point of boredom, right? To illuminate the illusion that this is as far as they can go. And now what's next? Be it that a different career, be it a different path, or be it just speeding up that process of where they want to go. So people that really have this, this serious desire to achieve more, not just financially, in their relationships, in their health, in their life with their kids, everything. It's a holistic approach. So once you get to, to that level, the anomaly wants to have, have it all. And we always get taught, you can't have it all. But that's a lie. It's an illusion. You can have it all. Once you understand how your mind works and once you understand how reality actually works. So that's the anomaly. And then you mentioned the illusion. So this is my favorite, one of my favorite, favorite topics. And this is literally, I, I love, I love going into this because in my opinion, again, everything is an illusion. The whole world that you see is constructed entirely in your mind. And based on what you believe, what you think, what you taught, what you've learned, you will actualize all of that conditioning and you will notice that in your, in your 3D world, but it's all created in your, in your mind. There's, there's not one single thing that's been man-made that wasn't a thought before you see it, your computer, your phone, your building, everything was a thought. So we construct our, our reality completely in our minds and we create illusions. We, we create stories about the way things are or the, or the way things should be. Should I, should I not, can I, can't I, will I, won't I? They're all illusions. You can do whatever you want when you start to, to generate these actual beliefs inside of you. So, and more on a science side, on a, on a scientific side, um, we, we receive 400 billion bits of information per second through our five senses. Okay? Just our five senses. There may be more. There's a sixth one people talk about, but for this conversation, we'll just talk about this for now. Um, maybe a seventh one too, if we go really deep. But... I want to know what the they are. Okay. Go through all the senses and then we'll go through the bonus six and seventh sense. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. So, so, so the five senses receive 400 billion bits of information per second. Right. That gets deleted, sort of or filtered down to 2000 bits of information per second. Okay. For us to, to, to be aware of consciously. So this is the latest science that we have. It might have been updated, uh, but as far as I know, this is the latest science, okay? So 2,000 or 400 billion is what we are actually consciously aware of, of what we can see, of what human beings can pick up. There's other stuff that we can't see, gamma rays, Wi-Fi, X-rays, sonar. Um, we can't hear what dogs can hear. We can't smell what dogs and animals can hear. So, so, so there's so much more out there, right? So we only get to see 2,000 bits of that based on our conditioning, what I believe. So my reality is completely different to yours, right? Based on your beliefs and where you were, you, 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 where you were born, where I was born, we, we all get brought up culturally differently. So we could be looking at the same thing, but interpreting it out and have a completely different perception of that based on what we believe. So the same information, can be interpreted or is interpreted by every single human being completely differently. So we're living in an illusion. So it's your choice to decide what illusion you, you wanted to live in. One of pain and suffering, which I did for a long time, or one of fun, play and joy, where you get to create a life that you actually want. And I think that we've all been, and it's through no fault of anyone, but we've all been conditioned and um, programmed to believing that we need to suffer. Like work should be hard you know, to make money. No, it's bullshit. It's a bullshit story. And when you start to question that, you start to open yourself up and you start to raise your consciousness you get, and you start to become more aware. And that is the most powerful, powerful thing because illusion is everywhere. 
I mean, it's, it's everywhere. So illuminating that, and when people understand, they see it, it's like, holy shit, I've been living a lie my entire life. What can I do now? And I've got this far already. Wow, okay. What if you didn't have all, all this stuff? And, you know, um, tarring your experience of life. Uh, it's really, really powerful once a human being illuminates their stories. It is really interesting. I sometimes have these reflective moments where I'm like, gosh, we are just so weird as humans and we're living on this planet and the things that we do and the things that we create and the suffering that we create as well. I find it really fascinating. And we create it all. It's, it's, it's literally like, like, like you, we, you and I can have the same experience and, 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 and see it completely differently. I mean, if I, if I walked into a room or someone walked into a room and there were, there were five people sitting down at a table, no one says a word. This guy walks into the room and he gives each person a thousand dollars. Each person, each one of those five will, will react differently. One will say, thank you. One will be like, what do you want from me? You know, someone else might be, do you think I'm poor? Like who knows what people are going to think, but it's the same data interpreted differently. So we create these stories in our life, no matter what. And it's up to you and us, me, you, and everyone else to go, okay, what do I want this to mean? You choose the meaning. No one else chooses the meaning for you. So any event, a breakup, a divorce, is it the end of a relationship or the beginning of a relationship, a job, is it the end of a job or the start of a new job, start of a new career? Like you get to play. When you start to play, you change your whole physiological state. And that's, that's where, where the quality of your life is, is in your, your emotional state. You know, if you're in a great emotional state, your life's beautiful. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you've got a billion dollars or one dollar, the person in a better emotional state is having a better quality of life. Yeah, absolutely. And I see that all the time in the people that I work with, with their pain, their disease, their injury or their illness, is that there's all these diagnoses out there and two people have got the exact same illness or diagnosis or pain or injury but they respond at complete opposite spectrums of the scale. So I often say there's one person saying they're a 20 out of a 10 and there's another person that's a one out of 10 and it all comes back to her emotions. So I'd say pain is highly emotional. Your response to it is, is just a sensation in the body. Yeah, we do have pain receptors, but that is the link that I've noticed is your emotional state is just so key in your ability to recover and your perspective if you do experience something in your body like a disease state that might be chronic? 100%. Emotions, for, I mean, for myself, I've, I've experienced not any sort of physical, uh, really, really like physical stuff, but my emotions caused me to get into a massive depression. It was the way that I was interpreting the world that caused me to get really sick. So I suppose that, that, it, that it is really, really sick. I was diagnosed with clinical depression, clinical anxiety, bipolar, which are all lies, all these labels that um, were put on me. But it was funny, when they told me I was depressed, I got more depressed. I really felt depressed because I started to believe it. Right? <laughs> the guy in a white suit tells me you're depressed and you need these pills. I got depressed. I, got even, I couldn't go to, I was at, at work that day. After that, I could not go back to work. I was, I was depressed because I believed it because this is what we get taught. We get taught to, you know, we have a construct of what depression is or what, I mean, you'll know in your work of what cancer looks like. If you have cancer, you die. Who said, like, who said you're gonna die? You can come through it, you can come through anything. Um, and I chose in that point to be a victim um, at that stage of my life and get depressed and then use drugs to get more depressed. Mm. Um, and and thought, thought that, that the drugs would help me, cocaine and weed, and um, it didn't really just made me even more depressed and then I could actualize and I could tell yeah the doctor's right I'm 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 depressed you know so 100 and it was all due to emotional trauma um from from a young age but with regards to emotional trauma it wasn't like something massive happened to me it was stuff that I figured out later it was these small little things that just through no fault of anyone like teachers or parents or whatever like you felt abandoned because your dad didn't come home from work I don't even know if that was one but this is what I see a lot of my clients. And it's not, mm. and these micro traumas are the, are the root of what you experience later in your life. And, and that was really insightful. So that emotional pain, if, if left unchecked, and human beings don't have ways of coping with emotions because we're not taught in school. 
Yeah, so, exactly. I like to use the phrase processing emotions rather than coping. I don't think we should cope with emotions. I like that. What about integrating? Do you like integrating rather than processing? Yeah, integrating sounds good too. It's like, you know, when people work with us and they process those emotions and they become vulnerable, it's all about how do you integrate it into day-to-day life, not just for the 12-week period or the year long that you work with a coach or the one day. For sure, for sure, yeah. Can I integrate? Yeah. Oh no, I am just caught up on these six and seven senses. So before we go into your story, because it is definitely a big part of this, I wanted to, can you just go through what are the five senses to recap for people? The five senses? Yeah, I know they're basic. Um, This is sight, smell, hearing, taste and touch. I think that was right. Yeah, yeah, great. (laughs) <laughs> and then what, so they're the five senses that you talked about where we were receiving messages on the constant. Um, and what is the sixth sense? I'd say the sixth is intuition. Just yeah. a, 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 real, a, real, a real gut feel or a knowing from, from your heart. And the seventh is, is a sense that you get when you start to get into playing with the quantum field and understanding what you can feel and see and and create from there. And, the, and, and, and that's a whole nother level of creation, but sensing at the same time, because you're sensing what this, what this feels like before it occurs and you experiencing that feeling before it occurs. So I'd say those two. Okay, great. And quantum, that's a big word for a lot of people as well. So can you describe what a quantum leaf is? And that's probably more from your experience working with clients and then we'll go into your story. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, so, so quantum, so yeah, let's give you a example. So quantum is a, is a big word essentially for, I mean, and, and quantum physics is the most, uh, it's, it's the best science that we currently have. I mean, it's been around since I don't think the 1880s, 1890s, maybe before then, not too sure. Um, and, what it is is basically the study of subatomic particles at its like a root, root sort of clinical level. But as you get into it, it's it's the field of possibility that we that we can't see. And just because it's invisible doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? So they proved this now in science that it does exist. So the quantum field is just the bridge between your inner and outer world, essentially. And it's a container for all things. The whole world is in this quantum field. There's we think that space is empty, like air is empty, but it's not. There's this field and, and inside it, and, and, and it's a container for, for everything inside of us. So it's the bridge between our outer and inner world. So whatever we feel, we, we, what we think about will be created in the 3D world. Whatever you think about it beyond space and time, um, you can create in the space and time. So that's like a bit of, clinical might be a bit boring for some people, but, 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 but the, the, the understanding of what a quantum leap is or quantum creation within clients and stories that we that we've got you know is when someone comes to you and they've got, they are they are suicidal like I've, I've got a few clients or i've had a few clients in the past when i first started working who who come to me suicidal using drugs didn't know what they're going to do completely um you know like what's the point of life uh, and within three days after healing this emotional trauma and pain, three days, hey, like they've been going to psychologists for years, three days, understanding what the root cause is, back at work, new jobs, left that job, created, enjoying their life. Like that, that to me is a quantum leap. Or clients coming to me and they've got issues at, at work and they don't, even, they don't even mention the issues with their, their wives or their husbands. And after two days, they... they they are back having sex after, after not having sex for, for six months or like once every four weeks, you know, I mean, that sounds like a chore, you know, and, I, and I've been there too myself. I think, I think people have all been in relationships and it's about owning that truth and going, okay, why is that happening? So things like that, that, that you, you can't explain, you don't know what, what it is, but when you start to raise your level of consciousness and you heal this emotional trauma, everything in every other area of your life just starts to quantum leap and you can create what you want. Because your energy is not sucked away. It's all that energy. Your, your energy is stuck in this emotion. You, you know this well. And once you release that, you've got more energy to create. Right? And then you can put that into play with whatever you want. It's, it's malleable, this reality we call, we think is so fixed. It's, it's completely malleable. 
Oh, it's incredible, isn't it? And I know that when a lot of people work with me, they're just like, oh, I had no idea that this is what I was in for. And in the early days, there's often a lot of tension around relationships and like, I'm meant to be working on myself. I'm like, yeah, but when you work on yourself and you change that expression of yourself, things are going to drop away. Things are going to be challenged and new things are going to come into your life. So it is, as you say, the quantum is seeing the possibility and it is so nice to see those key milestones that people um, reach throughout their journey when they're being coached on a much deeper level and one that takes into all aspects of life into consideration. It's, it's the most, well, it's the craziest thing because we get taught that life is going to be this way. Like I am forever doomed to have a bad relationship or have a bad job or, you know, this is how I am. I'm going to be fat for, for, for you know, for, I'm, I'm just this, or I'm angry. And when, and once they, once you go into this emotional stuff and it starts to integrate or heal or whatever you want to call it, like, um, you know, and they work on themselves, everyone around them changes all of a sudden. Yeah. And it's not about anyone else. It's about them. And once, once they start to look at, look at their own stuff and get, take noble responsibility and become very truthful about who they are in the, about who they are in the world. And they step out of, out of a victim mentality, which is where I was for, for most of my life. So I did it myself first. And then I was like, okay, how do I help other people go through this? And it's, it's, it's really fulfilling as you know, as well. Sure. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about conditioning based on where we grow up and the stories that I hear about South Africa is that people are getting murdered all the time. <laughs> tell me, tell me the stories you ask. I saw some people in, in Australia saying that we get like exiles or, or we'd, we'd be able to get refugee status, sorry. Um, or the farmers here, which is quite, which is quite cool. But yeah, it is, it's a, it's a serious problem. Yeah. That people don't really take seriously here. It's a massive problem. Um, and um, yeah, the government doesn't really take it seriously. They've got other, other, other things going on. I mean, there's more people dying here of murder today than COVID. And mm. COVID's taking precedence, you know? And that's been like this for a long time. So they gave, I mean, I don't want to go too political here, but if they gave as much attention to murder as they gave to COVID, we might have a better country to live in. But it's a beautiful yeah. place. But there, there, are, there, are, there are murders, a lot of murders. Yeah. So let's go into your story. Before you were this coach that was helping everyone illuminate their mind, who were you? Jin, okay, so it's, I, I, I was a little rebel. I, at, at school, I didn't enjoy school. I didn't uh, like the authority. I hated authority. I didn't understand why I had to listen to someone who was teaching me to regurgitate what they were telling me on a piece of paper. Um, I didn't understand why I had to listen to a bell when it rang um, and, and then move across. And we were just conditioned the entire time. So, so yeah, I, 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 was, I, wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a troublemaker, but I didn't, but I like to push the boundaries and to see what I, I suppose we all do as kids, but, but, I, but yeah, I did rebel um, from a very young age. Um, and, and I went to school very young. So I finished school when I was 17 years old and I, I started, I tried cocaine and, and ecstasy when I was 15 years old. Didn't really continue much in school, just tried it for like three, six months, which is still quite, quite hectic. <laughs> if you think about a child that isn't fully, fully developed yet, a little boy at 15 years old. Um, yeah, and then I was, I, was, uh, I was told and conditioned again or that, you know, if you want to, you know, live a good life. Well, at 16 years old, let me tell you this, this, this um, story. I asked my parents that at the lunch table, what's the, like, what's this life thing about? Like, do I just go to school, get good grades, then go to university and then get a good degree, then go, go to good corporate, get a good job and climb the corporate ladder, make enough money that I can go to maybe one overseas holiday a year, you know, and then have some kids, and then, you know, have some kids with my wife, you know, get married as well, um, send my kids to school, right? Maybe make some more money, maybe go on two holidays a year, who knows, you know, but have to put in leave. I was, I was like, Dad, you have to put in leave. Like, well, what is this? You have to like ask for leave. Like, I don't, I don't really get that. And, um, and then 
do that over again and over again and then my kids grow up and then I die. And they're like, yeah, it's pretty much life. And I was like, I'm fucking out of this game, Paul. I'm, this is not for me. So anyway, this is what I thought. And, and, and what did I do? I went to university. I studied accounts and finance uh, because that was the thing to do. It was, it was, you could get a secure job. You would, you'd make good money. People would, you, it was a status thing as well. Oh, it, the University of Cape Town, which is a very prestigious Cape Town, um, very prestigious university in South, South Africa, in South, South Africa. So I uh, went there and uh, didn't enjoy it at all. Um, and but when I was doing my honors, I decided to play some poker. So I started playing poker um, because I realized that I was going to make very little money um, as an article clock. So um, played some poker and then realized when I was doing my article clock or my training as an accountant, six months in, this was not for me because I was making zero money. I was making way more money playing, playing poker. So I resigned from my job to the absolute disgust and dismay of my parents and those around me who were at university with me, but I did not care. At this point, I just did not care. And I was like, did they know that you played poker? They did know that I played poker, but they didn't know that I was going to leave it, leave, leave a chartered accounting uh, uh, qualification to go play poker, <laughs> uh, which is quite a bit, but yeah, it was just like, that was the first time that I decided to sort of like, enough's enough. I don't agree with this. I wasn't having fun. I was depressed then at this, job accounting i was ticking with blue and red pen after studying for years like one of the hardest apparently the hardest degrees that you can get it's just regurgitation really as well um did you know that you were depressed so, at this time i don't think i knew that i was depressed looking back now i do like i had a, a mild state of dysthymia they call it these diagnoses and labels that they give you dysthymia which is like a constant set of depression um which i was drinking a lot using a lot of drugs um and and, and I didn't really enjoy it. Uh, so I decided, well, let me play some poker. I enjoyed that. It was fun because it was exhilarating. And I was doing what I wanted to do for the first time in my life. First time in my life, I decided, this is what I'm doing. Um, and, and from there, from the after poker, I moved to Europe for a year to, to, go, to go play poker. It was, it was, it was wild. Eh? It, was, it, was a, it was a whole different, whole different ball game, different hours, um, uh, a lot of partying, a lot of, uh, it's literally like no respect for your body or what you're eating or anything. So I was literally completely neglecting myself because um, I didn't know what I wanted to do as well. And um, then when I got back to Cape Town, 2011, uh, I just completely decided to go all in, in the party scene in Cape Town. And um, I got really, really, really deep into the drug scene. I was probably using cocaine four times a week. Um, which was, which which was quite severe. But I was, I would never, I was never an addict per se. Where, where because I don't like that term, that label. No one's an addict. I think I think you choose it, and then if you believe that that you're an addict, you will become an addict. Unless there are some physical, um, physical addictions like you get with heroin and that. But uh, for, for me personally, cocaine. I wasn't physically addicted. My cells didn't need it. I just needed it for my own confidence and my insecurities. Yeah, so, so tell yeah, me, that, what did the cocaine do for you? Why did you go the cocaine? cocaine? So, so for me, it was a status thing. I was very insecure. I didn't know who the fuck I was. I had no idea who I was. And, and it gave me a sense of people wanting me because everyone knew Troy, Troy had the cocaine um, and Troy would have the house parties afterwards, his house. Were you a dealer? All, no, I wasn't a dealer. No, I never dealt. But I always, but I always make sure that I had because there was my my connection to people. Like I was so disconnected from myself that the cocaine gave me, gave me this, this, this connection, connection to myself and that people were interested in me, right? Although people were interested in me and I had great friends, but it was like a, it was a complete, it was a completely, uh, it, was, it was me getting approval essentially. You know, human beings love approval, right? We need approval. And, and, I, and I, I never felt that I had approval in my life because I was doing, things differently but for the first time I, I had this approval and still just got too much too much and after a year I had left Cape Town actually to move to Joburg but it was for confidence and to to numb my insecurities uh, so do you, my view on people that 
take the drugs and alcohol, and I know you relate to this to a degree, is that it is a way of numbing out. But then something like cocaine or alcohol can just help someone lose those inhibitions and exude the confidence that they actually truly desire. So did it actually just make you more of who you really wanted to be? But the drug was the excuse. But, well, that's a nice question. Um, it, it, it made me, maybe not more of who I wanted to be, but it made me say the things I wanted to say and, and, and um, make the jokes that I wanted to make and just be carefree without having this, this, this limitation of who I should be in society um, and the expectations that people placed onto me for who I should be. Who came up with this idea of we should be what someone else thinks of you to be who the fuck you are? Like people are looking for purpose and joy, but they don't know, they don't want to find them until they find themselves. And, if, and there's no place to look for yourself other than inside of you. So once you find out who you are, um, it, was, it was easy for me to stop using, using drugs once I realized who I was. And I, and I had a vision for, for my future. So I didn't, because, I, because, I, you know, because I also didn't have a vision for my future, which was the most powerful thing. And that's why I was depressed. That's why I got to a suicidal place. Mm, okay, so you moved to Johannesburg. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I moved to Johannesburg <laughs> uh, to do property. So now I had to go back into something that was you know, legitimate. So I got into property and commercial industrial property had a great time, also didn't enjoy it though. And, and, this, and, and that culture was also fast paced, like do deals, party hard. And, and up to a point where I just got myself into a massive, massive de um, depression. And um, uh, at, at one point, uh, I, I remember thinking about killing myself. This was before I went into, into treatment. Um, and I was like, what, like, what, what, what the hell are you, are you actually thinking about? But it was so deep that I'd never thought about that as an option ever in my life, but it just came over me one day. And that was one of the scariest times of my life because it was, because once I thought about it once, that thought came into my mind a few times and a few times until it became an ideation of, okay, how am I going to do this? How would it happen? Because I was, a, I felt like I was a burden on my fiance, on my family, um, on, on people around me, on my colleagues at work. And I just didn't, I didn't enjoy what I was doing. I was so far off from, from who I was. The only thing I could do was continue drinking and using Coke, because that was the only thing that gave me any um, respite from, mm. from this. Yeah. You essentially hate, you hate yourself so much for not being you that anything like the, the Coke and the booze was just helping me uh, feel semi-normal again in my mind for that time. And then the next day I feel even worse. I mean, the anxiety the next day was terrible. Uh, so, so then I'd smoke weed to not feel, to not feel anxious. So the cycle just continued to continue to continue. Can you talk a bit more about the depression and how that felt? How did that manifest in your daily life for you? What was your behavior like, your sleeping habits? Jesus, so, so, so the depression for me, I was snappy. I was very, very snappy. Um, I, I, I was lethargic. Um, I would go to work, but I would do nothing at work. <laughs> I would do absolutely nothing. And I was a complete victim. I was like, everyone else should be doing stuff for me. I couldn't understand why I wasn't doing deals. Um, even though I was probably working three and a half days a week. Um, uh, as most of us were in the property industry because we just partied on Thursday and Fridays. And so, so, so the depression manifested in me almost, or me almost getting, getting so far away from the people that I worked with that it, that it became a problem where they were like, okay, I think you got to go type thing. Although they never said that, but it was this undercurrent of your energy here is just so bad. And this is a property. This is a very 3d world company, right? Like when they, when they say your, your, your vibe is off, then you got to know. So it, it manifested in me losing friends. It manifested in me um, not really having anyone except for my fiance. And um, she actually went traveling for, for, for two years. Uh, she's a bit younger than me. So she went traveling. And that, that was also added to that depression. Like, I'm not good enough. You know, like, she's now left me. So 
all these little things happen, but I was a complete victim, Jen, complete victim, and I take responsibility for it now, but in that moment, I couldn't see a way out. And um, yeah, it was a, it was a very, it was the darkest time of my life, probably for three years I was in, in the state, and I only re realized that I was really in the state when I had these suicidal ideations. Yeah. Okay. So going back to the suicidal ideations, you started thinking about, well, how am I actually going to do it? And what stopped you? So what stopped me, I'll, I'll, you, so I'll tell you the, the exact story. So I was, I came back from, from a meeting with my, with my coach slash psychologist. And uh, she told me that I needed to go, go, to, go to treatment. How did and you start the journey of reaching out to a coach or psychologist? What I was seeing her for about, for about two years, two, three years. Um, started, so I started when I wasn't sure about what, what I wanted, 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 wanted to do with regards to property if I wanted to change companies. So I went to go see her to see if I should change companies. And then she dug deeper um, to, to figure out what was actually going on. Um, so that's how I eventually went to her. And then she, I went on a whole journey with her. Uh, and she, um, she then said to me, Troy, listen, you are clinical. You need to go in for treatment um, for depression, and I said, "Okay, cool." She's like, "And you, and you, and you, have, and you have to go for drugs and booze." I'm like, "I don't have an alcohol problem or a drug problem." And she's like, "Okay, well, just go for depression then." So then I was, I was like, I was like, I was like, "This is absolute crap." Like, I'm not depressed, and I got in my car, I drove back home, and I remember uh, some guy a driver in front, a driver in front of me, uh, cut me off. And I got so angry and so hateful with rage that I went in front of him and pulled my car in front of him. I was, I was done. I was like, I don't care. This guy shoots me. He shoots me. Because in, 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 South, in South Africa, if you have road rage, guys have guns here, you know? So, so, so you never know. Someone might just pull out a gun, wrong day, wrong person, and shoot you. And I went up to, I got out the car, went up to him, and he was swearing at me. I was swearing at him. And uh, he said, come, and I looked and I stopped at myself and I was like, I was like, okay. I got back in the car, drove, got to my apartment or my, or my home and I sat in the car and I was like, okay, how, how, how am I going to kill myself now? Because that was, because now I felt guilty about how I behaved and then all these other emotions came up. So I was like, yo, I'm, I'm not worth it. I, I, I'm not good enough. I'm causing pain for my family, causing pain for, for my, for my, fiance it'll be easier if i'm not here which i think i've heard quite a few people who go into the suicidal ideation have these thoughts of it'll be easier if i'm, I'm not here. that's a very selfish thing to think like when you go you, people will miss you and um, so you're yeah, in, in the car sort of thinking about you know getting a gun and and killing myself and at, at that point i was like okay i went inside spoke to my fiance i said i've got to go to treatment and i was in treatment that afternoon Mm. I'm curious, did your fiance ever pull you up on your behavior? So we would, we would use together and we were like, we were like a little team. Like we used to party together. It was fun. It was fun at the start, you know, it was never, it was never bad, but as we didn't have, have a vision for what we were doing, we were engaged and we just bought a home and, um, it was now time to sort of start, start, start living life. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I wasn't really doing well um, financially and I wanted more and I felt demasculated, demasculated because how was I, like, I going to support her and I wanted to have a family and all this crap goes into your mind and just stories, it's illusion, like it's this illusion that I started creating for myself, it got worse and worse and worse. And um, her and I discussed that we had that, that day after I came in, we discussed that we were like, it's time, it's time to go. So she went to treatment as well. We, we, um, we um, decided that if this was going to work and if we did want to get married, it was time to, for, for both of us to go into treatment. So she had more of an alcohol, sorry? Or go your separate ways. Yeah, it was that, it was that. And we both decided, okay, we said like a three hour conversation going, okay, well, what do we actually want? Like we want each other and this is not worth it. So I'm not going to lose you for this shit, you know? So yeah, and then I went into the treatment center and I remember lying, lying on the floor um, in a complete panic attack. Like I thought I was going to die. Like I literally came close to, I thought I was, was going to die. Couldn't breathe at all, shaking, screaming for the nurses. And I remember them flipping me over and giving me an injection, my bum, an Ativan injection, which completely calmed me down. But I, 
it would lie on the floor after I got it, like shirt off, sweating, um, looking on like, like a hospital floor essentially, looking up, going, How the fuck did I get here? Like I had everything at my fingertips and I created this whole mess in myself because of all these stories that I told told myself. And that was the moment that I was like, never again. My life is changing. When I was on that floor looking up these nurses. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure there's more. Can I just ask about the process of checking yourself into a clinic? Do you go to a doctor or do you just walk up to one of these clinics and say, I need help? No. So I just phoned them. I said, listen, do you have space? And they said, yeah, they phone your insurance and they get you in. Right. And how long were you there so, for? I was, I was there for three weeks. It was, it was the most ridiculous three weeks of my life. I've never, ever. It was, it was, it was terrible. Like, it was like, like a mini prison. You got your pills, you had to walk up there, get your pills. And there was no, there was like a courtyard in the center. You couldn't go outside because people would escape to go buy drugs. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so it was a, it was a really, really humbling experience of my life. I was with people, um, in the same room as me who came from a completely different background to me with the nicest human beings in the world. And I looked at them and like, you, like they came from nothing. And I came from, from, from a privileged background and, um, I, I completely thrown it away. And within the, in that treatment center, I started helping people as well. I was like, fuck, I'm helping people here. I mean, help yourself first, Troy. And from there, I started to sort of, yeah, it was a very humbling experience, Jen. Like, like I'm thinking about it now. It was like it's a, it's it's quite emotional thinking about it again because it was a really humbling experience and uh, to sort of be there in that space and understand. Who I I did this to myself, and because I did it to myself, I can get myself out of it, and that's what I did. Yeah. So I'm just curious when I work with people and they say I'm feeling emotional now because you were saying to me that you haven't actually really spoken about this since it all happened a couple of years ago. Where do you feel this in your body when you say I feel emotional thinking about this? In my chest. Mm, okay. And can you take us through what else happened while you were in this clinic? What else happened? Yeah. Do you want, do you want some wild stories about other people or about me? <laughs> about me. About you. And you can throw in those other yeah. ones as well. Just your experience. <laughs> because I think there is, well, stigma with being diagnosed with depression, suicidal ideation. Um, and then uh, the stigma of I was in a clinic for treatment. Yeah. It's a that was a huge, huge thing for me, which was a massive hit to my ego going, cool, I went to treatment. So like, we're like, I always used to say when we were partying, like, rehabs for quitters, guys. Like, come on. Like, it was a, it was a, it was a whole thing. Like, and like, 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 we had one or two friends that had gone into rehab, but no one really spoke about it. And I was the first one that came and spoke about it because I was like, this is not, can't be a stigma. Like, if you have these problems and it gets that bad, right? If it gets that bad and you, at that point, go into treatment and, and get what you what you need, but the the treatment center itself, obviously, um, they only have about a, I mean, a three or four percent um, non return rate. Uh, so or whatever that's called, not too sure. I said the wrong term there, but three or four percent of people don't come back. The other 97 percent come back. So. Yeah. And that's, and that's something average in the, in the whole world, right? So, so, so there were some really good people there. I, I was well looked after. Um, we had, we had uh, sessions every single day, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, like CBT and that. Individually or as a group? No group. It was all group. It was all group. And then you would see your, see your psychiatrist and, and, and your psychologist once uh, or twice a week. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see them six times and they would assess you and see what's going on. Uh, psychiatrists would, would just up or up your pulls or down your pulls. So the whole thing was trying to get less pulls because we walked around like zombies in there. Like we were complete, like I, like I was completely drugged up uh, to the point of having, having hallucinations. So understanding about me about meds as well. When I was in there, I was like, I do not want to be on meds at all ever again. And, um, uh, I'm not on meds. I came off all my meds after a year of being in there. Mm -hmm. Good job. Experience inside there 
I'm trying to think, what are you looking for exactly? I can give you a bit more. Uh, whatever you want to talk about. I'm just curious. Okay, cool. There were there was a couple of guys in there that would that would that would uh, his, his name was Rasta. I remember. It's funny. This is a nickname. Um, and he really he was a heroin addict, and he was really really struggling, like properly struggling. And he escaped the one day, so we had to lock we had to lock down the whole place and do like a head count and check who who else was gone. And he'd he'd gone away, and um, uh, he'd found drugs, but they didn't find the drugs on him. He'd hidden them somewhere. They didn't search them properly. And that 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 night, I came out and I saw him smoking 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 some heroin. Some, Heroin in a rehab, which was quite a ironic uh, thing to see. But other than that, the experience was literally. To be honest with you, I can't remember the, the entire experience because I was so drugged up. Um, but in, but but literally, it's just waking up, showering, uh, getting your pills, getting your blood pressure done, um, getting an EEG done, ECG done, uh, all the tests, checking your brain, checking your liver, your kidneys, everything. They checked everything to make sure that you were healthy um, and, and there weren't any sort of problems ongoing. Um, and then we had, I mean, we had like play therapy. It was quite interesting. We like literally had to draw. We like went back to children like drawing and playing with Play-Doh and making necklaces, which was quite fun. Actually, I loved it. It was quite, it was cool. <laughs> Oh, it is great. Then we've got a play therapist in town and I refer a lot of kids to her and the adults often end up seeing her. And it's just this, well, it shouldn't be a strange concept, should it? Play. It shouldn't. Play is what we need to lean into as adults. Everyone that starts to play, I mean, you, you know this as well, like as soon as we start to play, we like, we reconnect with that child and that child, our default state is joy. It's not a bad state our default state is joy and we start to enjoy our lives more all this shit goes away the strife and the pain and the struggle and people might not like what i'm saying but like you get to decide if you have a joyful day or you have a shit day you decide it that's that's the thing anything can happen like but you decide how you react or how you respond to that thing and once you lean into joy your life becomes more fun and you might as well enjoy your life because you're going to die <laughs> yes Oh, we're probably going to touch more on this death thing in a minute. We've just been away for four days for a bit of a city break. And on the way home last night, we were driving and asked Violet, my six-year-old, well, Gav asked Violet, what's most important to you? Play, eating or sleep? And she goes, uh, can I, do I have to pick one? <laughs> can we prioritise them? <laughs> <laughs> and she picked play first, then eating, and then sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll go the same route. <laughs> yes. Okay. So when you get released from the centre, do you check yourself out or do they say you're ready to be released to the world? You, you, so you get three weeks that you, that you have to be there and then they assess you to see if you have to go to a secondary facility or you stay there for okay. a bit longer. But, ready uh, for the world? Yeah, so like you like you like you literally do everything you can to make sure you can get out. So mm. I was I was on my best behavior then. I'll tell you right now, way better than the school. <laughs> Did your parents know that you were checking yourself into a center? Yeah, yeah. I phoned them um, after I discussed it with my with my fiance Tam. Mm. Um, yeah, and they were like they, they were shocked because uh, they hadn't had no idea or they had suspicions that I was using uh, drugs. Um, um, but then they found out and I, I try to write a life story in there actually. And when I came out, I decided, I was like, well, you know what? No more lies, no more anything. And I wrote, and I, it was, it was deep. It was everything that I've gone through my life, like everything with the drugs, like the, the, how, like how much I was using, when I was using, who I was using with the, the, the sexual escapades. And I gave it to, to them and I went out to an NA meeting <laughs> and I was like, fuck, yeah, this is done or whatever. And I came back and it was quite freeing because I had nothing more to hide from, from them. And, you know, when you are using drugs and that, you're, 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 you know, and you start lying about, you know, you, you need assistance with this or assistance with that from your parents, you know, and you use the money for drugs, you know, potentially. There's a lot of guilt. So I've had to work through that guilt as well. Um, but, but it's nice to know that they, and they know everything about me. Yeah. That's interesting. So were you asking them for money to fund your drug ha habit? 
yeah, well, I was using my money for drugs and then I would, I would need money to sort of, sort of survive because I spent all the money that I made from poker on, on, on partying. Didn't yeah. Because I was a very profitable po um, poker player. I did invest a little bit, but, but um, uh, wanted to live the high life and thought I, w I could just keep on doing it. So, so yeah, I did have to, have to borrow money from them. And um, what did you tell them? Found out did it oh, it's, uh, you know, um, what did I actually say? I just said, listen, I'm just, you know, my salary is not covering <laughs> what I, my, my living expenses are. And they were very kind. I said, okay, cool. There was no questioning or anything like that. So, which was, which was, which was, which was bad, which was rough, you know? And um, those were the lies I would tell. And I was like, I'm never lying again. Like once I showed them that, that um, uh, book of my whole story, it was all, all out in the open. So I don't need more to hide. And now I live by this truth because it set me, if I can, like everyone says, truth sets you free. Truth saves you time. Truth yeah. saves you time. That's, that's the truth about truth. It saves you time. And, you, and then you get to create the time. Everyone says there is no time. Like we do create it. We create it in our mind as a construct. By telling the truth to anyone in your life, just, just tell the truth and you save time, the, the, the hassle and the energy of thinking about the next lie. Just cut it all, all, all out. And that's been a massive shift for me in my life with people. If, I mean, if people are talking crap that I don't want to hear, I'll say this, I don't even hear about that. You start to get sovereign, sort of like know who you are and you, and, you, and you decide what you want and you, you're not afraid to tell people the truth because you're helping yourself and you're helping them, to be honest with yourself. Yeah. I'm just curious because um, I know some of the people that I work with as well is that they have... Um, I guess their teenage children, but also their adult children who are in deep, dark places, either with depression or suicidal thoughts, um, eating disorders, um, drug addiction. I don't know if I mentioned that, mm. but they have trouble letting go and it's almost like they support that. Can you speak into that a little bit? Because I guess your parents were very supportive, but they didn't have to cut any ties with you. Well, it's enabling, right? Yeah. So, so, so they didn't have to cut any ties with me, but, but, but I think deep down they knew something. But you could like, like for them, I don't know what how how's an other parents are. They sort of had a blind eye, and they were just like, all right, we'll just make sure that he's okay and and he's surviving, you know. Um, purely out of love, it's not, it's not, but once you understand, like, like once then, if they understood them, they, they, or if they knew completely, they probably would have had a different outlook, you know, um, and maybe they just didn't want to see, I don't know, I've, I've never asked them specifically, or my mom said that she had an inclination, but she didn't go deeper in, into it to, to, to dive a bit deeper, but those, those people, when you, when you said that disconnecting from them, what did you mean, just so I can answer that properly? Mm, I guess um, when I work with people, I say, look, you've got to make that decision whether or not you keep on supporting them. Like, you know that that money is going towards drugs or um, alcohol or whatever, but actually, yeah, they're in a pretty bad place, but maybe they haven't reached their darkest point to result in that, um, that massive turnaround, that pivotal point. However, it can go either way, which is why I think people get scared. It's like, well, okay, if I step away from that person, maybe they will suicide. So, you know, the story of like the relationship and one of the partners, like the boyfriend says, if you leave me, I'm going to suicide. So do you stay with them or do you step away? And maybe then they realize, okay, like you had, a, you had that moment in time on the hospital floor where you realize that you had created everything and that you can change your life. But the risk is, is that person does tip, tip the other way, but it's exhausting for the parent or the friend or the partner to keep on supporting this. And this is where I talk about, well, you need to take responsibility for the decision that you made and not have regrets if it does go the other way. I think, I think that's probably one of the hardest decisions for, for a parent because as well, that person, that they, if they're getting the money from parents or family or whatever, or friends even maybe, or uncles or aunts, whatever it is, that person knows that if they stop giving them the money, like this is, this is, this is now we're talking deep, like 
mm. deep addiction here, okay? They'll find the money somewhere, right? They'll, I mean, we can, they'll prostitute or they'll steal or whatever they're going to do. So the family will be like, okay, we, we don't want them to do that. So they're caught in a very tough position. So until that human being decides to take responsibility, there's actually nothing that they can do. And they would decide, like, I think that's an individual choice. I don't think there's a right answer or a wrong answer. I think it's, it's a very tough place to be. Um, and I thank God that I wasn't that, that far down into a physical addiction um, or yeah. physiological addiction. Yeah. Thanks for that. I just wanted your point of view. And yeah, I know it's probably like a topic all on its own and there's different perspectives, but the good thing that you said, well, which I agree with is that sometimes, you know, people just aren't ready. They have to be ready when they are. One, one, 100%. Like there's nothing, like no one can take responsibility for you. Like you, you can't take, take, take any responsibility for me and I, I can't take any responsibility responsibility for you for you and once we do take responsibility for ourselves life changes and you start to see things that weren't there before the illusion expands yeah yeah so you got out and then what did you do with your life did you go back into property real estate no i got out and i went straight into learning about my mind i was like i need to figure out if my mind it was so negative and it got me to this dark place What's possible if I learn how to shift my mind into a positive state? I'm not just talking about positive thinking. I'm talking about embodiment of, of this feeling because positive thinking does not work if you've got these, these tarred um, intentions and beliefs behind yourself. Uh, Absolutely. So, I agree with that so much. And I unfortunately see a lot of people who are just teaching people positive affirmations and it's like, Mm, yeah. And I say, if the positive affirmations aren't working for you, you've got to do the deeper work and then come back to the positive affirmations when you're actually ready to really believe it and embody it, as you say. 100%. It's, it's, so, it's so funny. There's affirmations. People are like, oh, just do affirmations. But you, haven't, you, you still don't believe that you can do this. So it's not going to happen. And the belief is everything. Like in the science of belief, the, Bruce Lipton wrote that book, The, the Biology of Belief, like that. That book is so, so powerful. And once you understand that, you can understand that affirmations don't work. The law of attraction doesn't work either unless you actually have done the work before. You can only yeah. attract with the energy that you have. If you don't believe that you're going to, and people like, I'm, trying, I'm, like, I'm manifesting. These, yeah, I'm not going to go into this, but <laughs> people are like, I'm, I'm manifesting. Like, what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you actually manifesting? You just, you just decide that, cool. Understand that your energy might be a bit off and you've got to do a bit of a deeper dive into, into why, or, or, or I manifested this, but I'm not going to, but it's taking me so long to, to manifest this other thing. <laughs> well, why? You've got, to, you've got to understand why, like, it works. It's, it's, it's in the quantum field. There's possibilities. Yes, you can manifest anything, but you do the work first. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit like meditation as well. As I've had quite a few people say to me, yeah, my partner meditates, but then it's all out the window when they just lose it. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah. <laughs> Meditation isn't like the be all and end all. <laughs> no, the meditation is also not going to work unless you actually you know, embody that throughout your day as well. And you can yeah. meditate during the day. It's not just like 10 minutes in the morning and, you know, now you're fine. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff behind it. There's always deeper, there's always depth to every topic. And when you start to explore uh, those topics, you'll find out so much. So any topics that you, that you, that you, that, that anyone's heard, heard on this today, explore them and, and see for yourself because don't take my word for it. Don't take Jen's word for it. Explore yourself. And once you start to learn and adopt, you'll integrate it and you'll start to see those for yourself. Yeah. And there is no one size fits all. You've just got to give it a go and see if it works for you. And there's so many styles, like there's so many diseases out there. <laughs> there's so many styles of meditation out there. You've just got to try it out and see which style works for you. So many different coaches out there and you've got to find the person that matches. Exactly. And, and you got you to ask questions. As I, th I think that the, 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 the world has stopped asking questions. Mm. Like, don't just believe what people say. Don't believe me. Like, ask questions. Like, I love when people question me. I love when people give me backlash. Like, it's, it's fine. It's good. Let's, ask, let's start a conversation. And let's, yeah. not, let's not cling to our opinions as, as, as a truth. I'm willing, willing to change my mind about anything that I've said. Mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I am presented with more information that helps me make a better decision because I, you know, because I want, 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 want to grow. So as you learn things, ask questions and you'll find out more interesting things about it and, and see if it's true for you. Yeah. 
And I like that you're up for a challenge because, or people to question what you're doing, because a lot of people would stop speaking their truth and voicing their opinions for fear of the criticism and judgment or someone challenging them. And I'm like, well, this is an opportunity for you to educate and to share why you do this work or why you stand for that opinion. And I, it's a really nice place to be when you don't get triggered, but you see the opportunity to share more. It's, it's a beautiful place to be. I mean, I used to get triggered a, a lot, like all the time. I, I had some serious anger issues um, and understand. And when I ask questions about how you actually integrate the stuff uh, or these emotions, right? And you can not get triggered and, and have a conversation with someone. It's a lot of fun, but you can't always have a conversation with someone that, that is getting triggered because they're unresourceful, right? So you've got to pick who you talk to and or, or not pick who you talk to, but pick how you respond to different people. Like, there's no point trying to convince someone and, I, and, I, and no one should be trying to convince anyone else. No one should be giving advice as well because our advice is based on our own beliefs and our own conditioning. So even when you give people, and this is like strategic business advice, for sure it makes sense, but in your life, like telling you how you should behave or think or talk or yep. show up. I, I, don't, I don't think any person should be giving someone else any advice, but, but, it's, but it's, it's a conversation to be had between two people that are, willing in that, that are willing enough to be mature enough and open enough to have a conscious conversation about any topic in the world. Like we should be able to discuss right and left political views mm. openly without it, you know, let's not go there. But yeah. that's how it should be, you know, yeah. um, to, to like learn and grow. Yeah. But, I just keep on thinking of your road rage. It's like, imagine if that guy just turned around and tried to counsel you in your road rage. You would not have been able to hear it at all. And no, I imagine, hey, what's coming up for you now? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I talked weird. about road rage um, on another podcast as well. And my response to road rage when I see it, and if I'm ever in the car with someone that has road rage, I'm like, oh my God, you're just such a dick. Like, why are you responding like this? You're a dick, but I do have compassion that maybe you've got some stuff going on in your life and this is why it's manifesting as road rage. But I know a lot of people take offense to road rage and then, you know, they get the emotional, the physiological, the physical reaction within them because all of a sudden they question, like, did I do something wrong? But then they can't stop thinking about this person that just, ranted and raved at them or even just like shook their fists in the window um oh gosh where was i going with this oh yeah so for if you if you get triggered by that person who has road rage just think okay that person has probably got a lot worse issues than what you do so don't don't take on that energy for sure it makes it makes sense also if we're getting triggered i think we ought to do work as soon as you get triggered ask yourself why yeah. This is like, like as soon as you get triggered, like, what, like, like, what is that? Like, like, why? Like, what's going on? And that's the introspection that you get to do. And people don't do this, but, but when you start to start to do it, and not, and not just let those emotions come over you, like, you start to figure out the deeper meaning behind what's actually going on inside of you, and you get to know yourself a bit better, and you yeah. can integrate that stuff to not be triggered next time. And when you when you when you stop being triggered guess what? Your life becomes joyful. Yes. Okay. Tell me more. Anything About what? I've missed. <laughs> okay. So, 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 so emotional like triggers, right? Or anything you triggered, have to be about triggers, but I like you know, to. I'm go and, so, so triggers, like everyone has this fucking word these days, trigger, trigger, yeah. trigger, right? You, you, or any emotional reaction is called that. Any emotional reaction that you have, and if you're living your life like like I was in a, in a victim mentality, moaning and complaining and blaming and all this crap that that's not true, it's an illusion. Just remember that we are all going to die, human beings, and we're on this earth for a very very short time. We've been around for two for two hundred thousand years, human beings for, before present. Um, and we on the earth for 80 to 100 years, right? That's what we believe we will be. So we will manifest that. Of, we could believe that we live to 200 years and everyone starts living to 200 years. Who knows? Like, it's just a belief, okay? But we're here for a very short period of time, okay? And you get to ask yourself, well, I get to ask myself now every single day, like, 
how, if I had a week left to live, what would I want to be doing? How would I want to be feeling? Who, how would I want to be thinking? Who would I want around me? How would I be treating those people around me? What work would I truly want to be doing if I had a week left to live? And when I ask myself, like, like, like I see death as, as, as the greatest gift that we could ever have because without death, we could never live, okay? And death is just another experience. This is right now, this podcast is just an experience, mm-hmm. right? Everything, everything I do is an experience. Driving my car is an experience. I get to do this now and this now and this now. And when death comes, death is just an experience. We shouldn't fear death. We should embrace death and actually go towards the pleasure of death because it's a privilege to die. Because without death, how would we ever know life? So this emotional shit that we go through and that we dive into, and I know, like, like I know, like I've been there. And I look back and I go, holy shit, I wish I actually understood this deeper back then. But actually I don't because it's a beautiful journey that I've created and gone through. And how do you want to spend your life? And the fear of death is actually, see it as the joy of death. And just reframe it because it's just someone has someone told you, maybe dying is scary, like what it's going to feel like. But if, you want to, if you're scared of dying, do some research on near, near death experiences, people that, and they all have similar experiences. Yes. And it doesn't seem scary at all. It seems fucking joyful. Yeah, there's um, a Netflix series out, and I just watched it the other day, and I found it fascinating. People recounting their near death experiences and the realms that they went into. And there was an orthopedic surgeon who it's opened her mind. And I guess now she lives a completely different life. And it was really interesting because when she was having her near death experience, she was submerged by the water. Um, in a kayaking accident for 30 minutes so she should be dead she should be a vegetable now but she's actually back doing spinal surgery and she got this interesting message that her son wasn't going to live um, much past the age of 18 and you know she unfortunately she lived every day going is this the day is this the day and then he got to 18 and she kind of breathes a sigh of relief and then a couple of days after his 18th birthday he was um, hit and killed by a car wow so, really? Yeah, just those kind of experiences. And she said, and I think there's groups for people to talk about this because it's not widely accepted. And I think that we should just go around with an open mind because sometimes our clients tell us really strange things. And it's like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm not going to discount it. That's your experience. There's, there's something like, like if you look at like, like I've researched near death experiences for a while, like in countless, countless cases, and they're all very similar. And you are consciousness. Like people say, like my leg, who's, who's the my behind the leg? Like who's this my, like my arm, my body, like who's the my, isn't it just body? Like, like, no. So who's the my, your my is the consciousness is your, your consciousness inside you. Well, we don't really know where it is. It could be outside of us or inside of us. Don't we still sort of working it out, but it's consciousness. Okay. We go deep here, but it's, you are consciousness like you are like like you are conscious and that consciousness is energy and energy cannot be created or nor destroyed it can only be transferred so if you're worried about death just know that your consciousness doesn't die your physical body dies Mm. right wherever that consciousness goes on cool like this is my belief from what i've studied i'm not saying it's true or not because i've got no idea of knowing it's true true or not but it 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 it, it, it's an attitude that, that 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 empowers me so i get to choose that attitude and i get to have fun with it yeah. You get to choose their attitude. You, you, like everyone gets to choose their attitude. And if you have one that's scary for death, well, and you enjoy it, keep it. But if you don't enjoy it, try something new. Yeah. Create a, and come out of that illusion into a new illusion. It's beautiful. We get to <laughs> create new illusions all the time. <laughs> so if you had a week left to live, would you be happy with how you lived your life? How I've lived my entire life. Hmm. And what you're doing now? Y- yes. I think... For, because where I've ended up now, what I'm doing is I'm fulfilled every day. I don't have, I don't, I don't have work-life balance. I've got, I've, I've got just life. And, and um, I, yeah, if, if I had to live every single day of my life like I'm living currently now, for a week, 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 week for one week left of my life, I would be pretty, pretty happy. I feel, I feel fulfilled and I feel like I've gone through a lot that was self-inflicted. No one else did it to me. I did it to myself. Mm. And coming through there and understanding that I did that. And, I, and then by 
by owning that I did that, I could change it and I did change it to create a life that I actually want, uh, going against societal norms of, I mean, a coach, like, like my friends, like, Troy, you're a network and property and finance. Like, what are, you, what are you doing coaching? Like, okay, well, how's your job? Are you enjoying your day? I'm loving my day and I'm you know, doing the best I've ever, ever done. So it's phenomenal. And I'm very grateful for what I've been through. And then I'm still alive to experience it. That's what I'm grateful yeah. about as well. Yeah. Yeah. The coach is just such a generalized term for people that do all sorts of things with their clients, all sorts of really interesting stuff. And I was chatting to my husband the other day, because I've just, I get these random thoughts. I get a lot of random thoughts <laughs> around the title and the status. And when we're quite young or it can happen when we're older as well. And when you ask someone about this person that they've met in their life, so an intimate partner, and the first thing they tell you is, oh, they're a chef, they're in finance, they're in real estate, they're a doctor, they're a lawyer. And that's what actually attracts them amongst other things. But then in the work I do, and I think we all know people like this, is that there are so many people in these high status jobs or perceived high status jobs who are absolutely miserable. So you can be the chef that's happy. You can be the lawyer who's really happy, but it's not the job that actually gives you the happiness and the joy in life. 100% not. And if that person's aligned with that job, I know plenty of people in finance and, you know, and accounting and law who love their jobs because they're aligned with it. But when you go after it for the title or the label of it, it doesn't stack up all the time. And those are the people that are unhappy in it. And it's like, like those, those professions are amazing. It's they're needed and we need them, right? And I love those people because they, they, they're my clients as well, yeah. right? So, 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 but when you're going after for the title or the label, like you said, like, oh, I'm with this guy, or this guy, well, he's in finance. No, his name is fucking John or whatever it is. He's a great guy. Who cares what he does? Like, yeah. his identity. Like, and we had we've been taught this to, to this identity is so important. Like you've got to, Oh, well, John, you know, he's a, an actual scientist. Oh, well, you've made it now. Really? Okay. What if John's a, what if John's a really bad human being, you know? <laughs> yes. Gosh, my parents were like, you should become an actress. They're like the highest paid and whatever. And I'm like, Hmm. Okay. What is it? Just numbers. You know, I'm so glad I didn't go down that pathway. <laughs> So when you work with your clients, do you take them through a near-death experience? <laughs> Not a near-death so, experience, but like, no. <laughs> I'll let you elaborate. No, so, 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 so I'll, I'll do something with them where as I go through the process with them, I'll figure out what they are fearful about and we'll, we'll, we'll work on those fears. But there'll be something that, that, that's like, Oh yeah, I'm scared. And, and then I'll, I'll, I'll integrate that into the process. So it'll be something like, I don't know, like, you know, jumping through a river or, or through, through a gorge, right. Or going up into a plane and, and, um, uh, and doing flips in an acrobatic or going in a F1 car, you know, or something that that's, that's, that's really adrenaline seeking that is on the edge of if something goes wrong here, I could, end it um or there might be something a little bit deeper which i'm still working on now um that i'm not too sure uh i should say <laughs> or okay. or i don't actually have anything that's that that, that aggressive yet but yeah um it's not going to be anything like things like i won't do is like something like skydiving in south africa um maybe somewhere else just because it's not i don't think it's that safe Oh, there's loads uh, of stuff over here in New Zealand. You should bring your clients over here. I know, it's, uh, I know. I'd, maybe I will. I think I definitely will. But there's a lot of stuff, like I don't know, beautiful like mountains, like uh, abseiling or whatever we, we could do. Like so many like, adventurous things. So there'll be something that that is definitely scary. So they get to that point of fear and they go, okay, cool. It's not that scary. Yeah. Once you break that fear down, but it'll be specific to to them. It'll be customized to to their fears in order to break through that. Yeah. My husband's a mountain guy. So he takes people into the high mountains and a question that I know he asks, and I sometimes get to meet his clients and we have these in-depth conversations is why do you want to climb a mountain? And I'm sure there are people, a lot of people who hire other mountain guides who are just at this midlife crisis. They've got everything, 
but they want more and then they want to feel on the edge of death. So they want to push those barriers. And what I love is that he facilitates that journey and it's not about just climbing the peak and bagging that it's the journey and overcoming those fears. And I think he started off and he was actually quite scared of heights and now he does lots of solo climbs and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so I think it is fascinating to get into the minds of those kind of people and the clients who want to do those kind of activities is like, why do you want to do it? What are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to feel? What's the intention behind it? Like what's really going on? And you get yeah. to get deep like this, ask, like, ask yourself this question, what's the intention behind anything that you're doing? And you'll start to dig so deep into yourself and into like, like it's, it's, su it's such a powerful question. Uh, mm. It seems simple but when you sort of think about it. Yeah. And you become, and, and then you have deeper conversations and you have more meaningful re relationships, which is the most important thing. Yeah. Ask people real questions. Like, How's the weather? No. Like, what's, what's really going on? Like, like, why did you do that? Like, yeah. what are you thinking about? You know, what are you feeling? I mean, how many people ask, like, how are you feeling? How are you? So, like, generic, how are you actually feeling? You know, to, and like, ask people that and they go, they get confused. They're like, what do you mean, how am I feeling? Yeah. Like, great. Are you? And then you get into a deeper conversation, more meaningful. Yeah, I was thinking of that the other day as well as one of those random thoughts that came into my mind is how many people don't answer when you say, how are you? And I'm like, I am actually asking you because I am genuinely interested in how you are. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll go and I'll ask it again and sometimes a third time. I'm like, hey, I can ask you, how are you? Are you ignoring me? <laughs> I want to know what you're up to. It's unconscious. It's good. It's, they've heard it a thousand times. They're like, okay, cool. Whatever. Yeah. Or people reply to you, or what I do is I don't even ask them. But they go, "How are you?" And then, and then I say, "Good." And then they say, "Oh, me too." But you didn't ask them how they were, just to see what happens. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> and that's a big thing for me is pulling people up at an appropriate time when they say "good," and I'm like, "Are you really good? What's really going on?" Yeah, and then for they reply. Sure. <laughs> so. You came from a place of suicidal thoughts. Um, if there's anything else that you want to touch on, let me know. But what would your advice be to someone who might be listening to this, who knows that they're getting glimpses of these thoughts? I would say literally reach out to someone close to you because they, 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 they will love you and they don't want you to go, right? And, and they will miss you. So when I told my family that they, they couldn't leave it until I told my fiance that like, what's like, do you know what, like, how would they feel? So think about them. And it's not always like, it's not a selfish thing is to understand that there is someone there that loves you, even though you might think that they don't. Cause I didn't think that I didn't think anyone loved me. I think people hated me and I was a burden, but it's not true. When you look, when you, when you, when you reach out to someone and just discuss it with them, and spend a night with that person, whatever, just like tell them everything that's going on. Open up, be vulnerable, because vulnerability is courage, as everyone knows now from Brene Brown, the vulnerability re, um, researcher. And she's, she's changed it. I mean, it's a, in a whole different sense, which, which talks about, but being, being open and just asking for help, I would 100% I would say that. And be okay with it, and know that people do love you. Hmm. And... What kind of clients do you work with exactly? Or is it just a whole range? I work with, yeah, I work with, I haven't really have a real niche per se in an in industry. That's why I say industry leaders. So there's people that are really, really bored and, and no, like, like I'm being, I mean, probably like, like seriously, they, they, they've achieved so much and they're on this treadmill. They're doing the same thing over and over again. Right. And then they try and do something else and do something else. But, they're not aligned with who they actually are. So they've, they, they bored and stuff's falling apart and, and their lives. And it's just the illusion. They know what they want, but they've been, but they've been doing something uh, in order to prove themselves to other people or based on the expectations of other, other people. And once they realize that illusion is, is fake, they sort of create and they've got the potential to create. They've got the drive and desire to create because they've done it before. So specifically those types of people that have, that have created amazing accomplishments be whatever that is and they're just feeling a bit sort of stuck i mean they say i mean i i i, I hate the word stuck but they use it right yeah. um something i'm just feeling like, for them. what's, what's, what's to do now like where do i go i'm a bit bored like what's next like can i recreate this like yes you can and helping them 
like just shift that illusion and then bam, because they've got the design inside of them. So people that are highly driven, anomalistic, and they outliers, like they, they, they think differently and they've got the balls to think, to, to think differently. Mm, right. And I think there's a lot of guilt around boredom when people have success already. For sure, because they're like, well, how can I be bored? Like, I've done so well, and you know, um, everyone else is working their asses off, and I'm, I'm not. Like, what's, what's yeah. going on? So yeah. for sure, and once you heal that guilt, they can move forward. So all yeah. emo- everything goes back to emotions. There's nothing. There's no problem in the world unless it's, it's all emotions. That what is it? Ninety percent or ninety-five percent of diseases that doctors, MDs, physicians agree with is caused by stress. Mm. But stress is an emotion, and emotion is a chemical in your body. It gets stuck and trapped. Yeah. And it causes inflammation. Like you know this so well, but that's what an emotion is, guys. It's a chemical that's causing inflammation in your body, that's causing you to be in fight or flight all, the whole time. So your growth repair systems are comp- your growth and repair systems can't work. Your immune system is shut down, and and people get sick. Fear causes illness. Yeah, I often say to people, if you can work through the emotional stuff, the really hard stuff, 95% of things will go away and then you'll be left with a 5% that you actually know that you need to treat with medications, with supplements or intervention like surgery. But that's, always that's so And that message like needs to go more, more mainstream somehow. Yeah. I don't know how, but, but once people realize that, I mean, I mean, their lives will be so much easier and they'll spend so... Um, so much less money on the drugs that they're using because they figure out how to use their emotions. That's why I don't teach emotional uh, agility or emotional uh, intelligence at school. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, how to get, how to yeah. get mainstream is I think just us having conversations. And for those of you listening, if this resonated with you is to make sure you share it. Um, how can people find you, Troy McTeer? Well, you can just, Find me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, I'm on there at, at Troy Mactia. Same as my name on, on, on both, on LinkedIn, at Troy Mactia. And um, you can email me at hi at com. That's probably the best way to get hold, hold of me. Okay, cool. I'll make sure I pop those links in the notes. And just one last thing, if you can share. As a male in this space, because I do think we need more men speaking about this. So I'm very grateful that you came on and shared. We had a really great conversation. What would you say to the men out there who are struggling? About, who's struggling with, with this addiction, drinking, not even addiction, maybe just using rec, rec, um, recreationally. I would say that, I would say the truth. If you are overindulging in alcohol and cocaine, or any drug, there's pain that you are numbing. And that's the truth. Like, what pain are you numbing? Discover that and then figure out what the intention is behind why you're drinking, or why you're using drugs. If the intention is pure, like I never had a problem with drinking, I had a problem with my intention. My intention was numbing. So if your intention is to have a good time and you know you have a drink every now and then, cool. But if you're numbing and it's causing you pain and you're getting and you and, and you're causing yourself anxiety, get honest with yourself. And, and figure out what that pain is. It might be something from childhood. It might be something from your ex-girlfriend or, or your boss, right? Or how, they've been, how you've been treated. Then speak truth to that person and sort it out. Speak truth to yourself first and take noble responsibility f- for your life and know that everything is the way it is because of you, no one else. Amazing. Thank you so much, Troy. I really appreciate you sharing your story and some tips and advice that will hopefully resonate with some people out there. Thank you so much. It's been so nice spending time with you. Thanks.